Hi, this is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Today I had the opportunity to work on a very old reel that was found by Scott at his West Coast flea market. And this one is called Surf Casting. I'm not familiar with the manufacturer. It uh, doesn't show up on some of the research that I do, but it's a very straightforward reel, circa the 1930s. And uh, we're going to show you how this reel operates. This is called a direct drive reel. That means you won't find the star adjuster. You won't have an anti-reverse. It's all powered by you. And uh, well, stopping the fish is powered by you as well. So uh, we'll explain a little bit about that. But the direct drive reel is the simplest of reels. It's a reel where the big gear turns a little gear, turns a spool, collects the line. On the way out, well, the spool just releases. And if it's going out, the handle is going to back pedal. And sometimes that handle is called a knuckle buster reel because if you're casting a reel, sometimes that handle is going to hit you right in the hand or in the knuckle if you're not paying attention while you're throwing your line out. Well, we're going to take this apart. We'll show you how it's made. And if you like these types of videos, I want to encourage you to sign on and uh, subscribe to my channel. And if you do subscribe to my channel, please use the notification button. That's going to let you know when and where I post videos. And sometimes they're very old reels like this, and the next day might be the, the most current line of a, uh, a spinning reel or a, a low-profile baitcaster or the like. This one, again, I don't know. It's called surf casting. And sometimes those are what's called trade reels in that the, there's a manufacturer out there who makes the same reel with different names on it and allows different places to sell a reel under their particular brand, in this case, surf casting. Well, this is a German silvered reel. That's the coating on it. And uh, it's a generally a nice reel. This one has got way too much corrosion on it. So it probably has to do not with the use of it, but with the storage of it. And we're going to try and knock off as much as we can. Unfortunately, you cannot restore the luster where the uh, finish is flaking. All you can really do is take care to try and stop or halt the progress of that. And then for that, I'm going to use a metal polish. This is an automotive polish. It's chrome polish by Turtle Wax. And uh, a 4-0 steel wool, which is a buff buff buffing type of a steel wall. It's not very aggressive. And uh, we're going to take the three side plate screws off here so that we can get at the spool which has the most damage. When I take this side plate screws out, I like to put them into a parts tray. I use the bottom of a fast food container for that purpose. And I also like to make sure that the screws are all the same size. This one's got kind of an interesting frame to it in that the crossbars here are screwed into the side frame here. So you don't need to necessarily remove those, but uh, it is kind of an unusual setup for that. Well, there's only three screws holding this on. This would be an ocean reel, or a deep lake or a great lakes reel kind of a thing. It has a large capacity to it. They would have used uh, Dacron braided line at the time. Uh, and uh, overall, it would have handled probably close to 300 yards of the line, and uh, that would go towards deep dropping or trolling, which is how this reel would be used. With the three screws removed, we should be able to remove the side plate. When not, we have to take this little uh, cap off. That's your spool adjuster. Now let's see if we can. Do, now we can remove it. And as I mentioned, this is at its simplest. A big gear turns a little gear, which is on the spool right there. And, uh, well, that's, uh, that's all that's happening with this reel. You can see why it's a little bit sluggish. This grease is dried out and solidified around the, the base. And uh, we're going to take this side plate off because I want to get to that spool. I believe that the easy way to do this is just continue doing what we're doing. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get these out. Sometimes these cross plate screws. They want to roll with the, the crossbar. Maybe what we can do here just to, to help things along a little bit is just wet some of those other screws with some penetrating oil and let that kind of work in. You can imagine these screws have not been removed in a very long time. 
and while well, that's going to cause this to uh, be a little tight for sure. When I get asked this a lot, when you're working on an older reel, how much should you clean off? Should you repaint? Should you uh, try and work to uh, restore the reel? And a reel like this is probably too far beyond restoration with all of the plating loss. You're not going to go re, re, uh, replate this. So the answer is probably just to clean it up as best you can and uh, let the uh, war wound, wounds, if you will, speak for themselves and uh, see if you can't uh, just make it very functional. Well, this is a good place to tell you to take pictures. Right now I'm just kind of taking the screws out, but you may wind up in a situation where that plate has to get remounted and well, the, the holes may not line up or something, and taking that picture will help that. If you look at the side plate, you'll notice also that there is no anti-reverse mechanism inside here. And that, uh, that means that it's going to spin both ways. And I get asked from time to time, can it be used left-handed or right-handed? The answer is yes. If you were, uh, wanted to retrieve the reel using your right hand to crank, you would mount it to the one side of the pole. If you wanted to use it to accommodate your left hand, you'd mount it to the other side of the pole. One more here. I'm checking as I'm doing this to make sure that all of the screws are the same length. And as it turns out, the two screws for the bottom appear to be a little bit smaller in length than the others. So I'm going to just put them off to the side. We should be able to remove the plate now. And remove the spool. Now the pinion gear is fixed on the spool here, so you can't remove that. And what we're going to do, we're going to just take that, that uh, steel wool again, a good amount of that polish, and what we're trying to do here is just knock off the rough edges. If you tried to put line on this right now, what would happen is the rough edges would rip the line, weaken it, and eventually, uh, well, it would cause it to break. Again, this is probably about preserving the patina and the story behind the reel and stopping any further uh, progression. So, what's usually happened when you find a reel like this is that it had the old line on it. The old line was wet. It was probably used in a salt water environment. And uh, while well, the salt just leached out of the line onto the spool, and when that happened, it just started eating away at the plating. All right, well, it's pretty, pretty smooth there. I'm feeling it pretty good. Just a couple of little ridges here I'm still feeling. I think that's probably about as far as we're going to be able to go with this. You could, I guess, put this in some kind of an acid bath if you wanted to. Uh, you can use all kinds of cleaners. You could use toilet bowl cleaner, which has the... Uh, the hydrochloric acid, you could use vinegar, you could use other things. It would probably strip off way more than we've taken here. And again, I would just like to leave this with some semblance of the plating on it. So I'm going to err on the side of just trying to polish up, get rid of the flakes, and kind of go with that. It's all judgment, it's all how you want to want to move with this. My idea is to keep the reels moving and uh, we should be okay with this. There's just a little bit more. Let me just take a, a little utility knife here and just run the side blade on it. That, that should pretty much do that. So Scott finds these reels at the flea markets in the Southern California area. So he's got a good mix there, but most of the time it's in the Los Angeles area. And most of the fishing that uh, fishing equipment that shows up at these fleet markets is saltwater nature and uh, of course so close to the Pacific Ocean and such a nice vital fishery over there that uh, well, it makes sense that as these things become unwanted that uh, they wind up at the flea markets. I know from time to time some of our viewers write in and say well we're not seeing those kind of reels in uh, Arkansas or Oklahoma or the like and the answer is sure, but you're seeing reels there that we don't see. Uh, I'm on the East Coast and Scott's on the West Coast. We just don't see those kinds of reels. 
We're going to use fishing wheel grease now. We're going to grease that little terminal there. That's for the back end of the reel. That's this piece here. This is the click ratchet. When you engage the clicker right here, that's got a nice sharp point on the tongue right there, which means this clicker has not been used very much. But uh, we're going to just make sure that everything there is wiped down. And we'll take that spool, put that right back in to that little piece. We're also going to take a moment to check the pinion gear that's attached. I'm making sure it's clean. It is. There's no grease on it whatsoever. That would make sense. It's been around a long time. Probably unused for a long time. The grease has either evaporated or fallen off the reel. In this case, it's pretty much fallen off the reel. We'll take that piece of steel wool one more time. There's a little bit of bubbling of the finish going on here. I want to take a cotton swab now and just go inside here and get the old grease that was on that pinion gear. Get it out of there. And I find that the cotton swab is a good way to do that. It's funny, I usually say I don't have a preference for cotton swabs and for penetrating oils and real greases and the like, but I actually do have a preference for cotton swabs. I do use the Q-tips. There's a lot of them out there that you can find. They have plastic shafts on it, and for whatever reason, those plastic shafts tend to, to break when I'm doing this type of a cleanup. They, they break or the, the cotton piece um, separates, and of course, you don't want pieces left in your reel. So that's probably a good reason to say, you know, the, the extra dollar or two for the package of the cotton swabs, in this case the Q-tips, well worth it. Alright, we've got the main body of the reel cleaned. We've greased our gear. Now we're going to go put all of this back together. I'm going to try and line everything up now. This is where the picture helps. I think I got it that time. What you want to look for is making sure that you have the point on each of the crossbars. These are the crossbar screws that I've taken out. I'm going to start those by hand. This one's always the hard one, isn't it? Well, if you have any questions on this reel, or any reel in particular, maybe uh, you're working on one and you're stuck, maybe you'd like to know a little bit more about the reels, whatever it may be, if you leave those questions, like the question here would be, why are you trying to put the side plate screw into the, the crossbar screw? That would be a good question. I just looked in the case here and that's where the side case screws are. No wonder I couldn't get that in. But at any rate, if you have any questions, maybe you want to know a little bit more about the reel, maybe you want to know a little bit more about the era of the reel, these being the 1930s and who was using what and what changes were made during that time in terms of production and manufacture, I'll just leave them in that comment section there and I will try to answer those for you. Uh, that's one in. Those go, certainly go in a lot smoother than the ones that were for the case. And you probably want to leave a little bit of playroom on these. Don't go tightening those screws all the way down because the bars have moved a little bit over time. Sometimes I don't get aligned right. Let me come up top here. And I'll put the top peg in. So direct drive reels were simple in design, very effective, and lasted for almost 75 years before uh, you started seeing 
uh, the advent of the drag wheels, the advent of the uh, removable free spool, or, so that uh, you didn't have to have the tur handle turning backwards, and uh, reels for the masses. So this one was not it probably was not a cheap reel at the time at all, and it was probably right up there with all of the other manufacturers. Being that the, I don't recognize the name at them, well, that doesn't mean too much. What that means is that during the uh, Depression era, there was a lot of folks that were trying to find other ways to uh, bolster income when their businesses were failing. A lot of clockmakers and the like were also into the mechanics of things like fishing reels. And, uh, well, they started to try and step out on their own. They either became very good local manufacturers, or in some cases, they really did build a business for themselves. That also happened again at the end of uh, World War II. You had a lot of manufacturing facilities that were dedicated to producing war materials. And, well, when the war ended, you weren't making any more of those. And a lot of those changed over seeking something else to do. And they were advised by the government that, uh, well, at the end of the war, people would have time for recreation. And uh, with that, uh, they said uh, to certain ones, uh, you might, might want to consider making fishing reels for that uh, group that's going to have some recreational time on their hands. Do the same thing with your main gear that you did with your pinion gear. Inspect it all. This one, again, is dead dry. And give it a good coat of fishing reel grease. I'm using pen precision reel grease for this. And we'll just put a little bit on the back here. Merge that gear into the spool. Make sure your side plate here is clean. It is. There's just a bushing in the case here. That's all that's going on. And while we took care of the other stuff with a steel wall because it was pitted. This one seems like it's pretty clear so I'm going to step down to a kitchen scrubby and a rod and reel cleaner and see if I can't just clean off the film that's on this side. We'll do that on the other side plate too once I button this reel up. But uh, the, the net on that is just go as aggressive as you need to go. Don't go any more. And if uh, you're in a situation where it can be removed with the paper towel first and just use the paper towel first. All right, we're going to put a little bit of grease on to the shaft where that's going to ride through this bushing. Then we'll line it all up. And now I can use those bigger screws that I tried to put into the side plate uh, at the other spot. These screws are interesting. They have a very thin slot in them. And one of the messages with that is always match your screwdriver slot to the slot on the screw. Don't try to go with a small screwdriver blade if it's a wide opening. You risk butterflying the, the screw and making it almost impossible to get out again. And of course if it's too wide for it, yeah, you just, the blade will be ineffective. Okay, one more we're going to tighten up here. And we need our handle. Oh, for the handle, we need that little cap. That's a spool adjuster cap. Just like the ones on modern reels, it's going to allow you to adjust the speed of the spool. And then we have the handle now. That's a square based handle. Line it up, bring it in. And our cap nut, cap screw. This one has a slightly bigger slot, so make sure that you use a slightly bigger screwdriver. And that's it. Surf casting reel. Let's see how we did. Oh, I told you I would buff up this side. Let's buff up this side while we're at it. I'm going to leave the original patina on it. I think it tells a nice story. You can see how bright and shiny that German silver would have been. It would have been a beautiful reel before the, the salt ate into it. It's still a nice reel. All right, give it a turn. Uh, one of the things I'm noticing is that the wooden handle, which is also an indication of age, is a little bit dried up. So I'm just going to use some penetrating oil on that. That'll help uh, turn that. Yeah, loosened it right up. All right. 
Okay, let's give it a run. So it turns nice and free and easy. It's a, still a good looking reel. Put a line on it. Nobody's ever going to notice the blemishes underneath that. You can take this fishing today and it would do very well. Again, because of the way it casts, it would be called a knuckle buster. When you throw the line, it's going to turn backwards. If your hand is on the pole, throwing it like this, you may just be the victim of the reel. When you fight the reel with a fish, you're usually going to use a thumb to hold the line so that it doesn't back pedal. You can also power it with your handle. Some of the older reels also have a leather fob here that you would use instead of using your thumb right on the line, you would press on the a leather fob to hold the pressure against the reel. So that's it. That's your surf casting reel, circa the 1930s. Not unsure of who manufactured it, and uh, it's a beauty. And you know what? Even the betel arm still works. Wow. I can see how it would be a nice, effective surf casting reel, too. That, that spool spins nice and easy. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. To our first responders and essential personnel, thank you for everything it is that you do to keep us safe. I truly do appreciate your efforts. To everyone, take a moment. Uh, it's around Thanksgiving. Appreciate what you have. Take the time with the friends and family. Stay watching and uh, watch the next episode, which will be coming up, well, right after Thanksgiving. This is Dennis with Second Chance Tackle. Have a great day.